This morning, the house of the Lord. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 21. You can follow along on the screen and also uh, in your Bible this morning. In the past few weeks, Pastor Mazzella has been talking to you uh, with a series that is entitled Meet My Jesus. And uh, we're going to kind of stick with that this morning. And we're going to kind of have two subtitles to that. The first one will be King Jesus. Certainly, as we're on Palm Sunday this morning, now we could take this moment to reflect on the kingly aspect of our Lord, and Jesus is King, amen? amen. And uh, if we really believe that, certainly there's some implications for our lives, how we live our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So the second subtitle is going to be that if He's King, we're in His service. We're in the service of the King. And that kind of makes me think back uh, to my days in children's church. Uh, when I was coming over from my office this morning, I heard them singing in children's church, uh, Jesus is my superhero. Was that what you guys were singing there this morning? Uh, so I don't know if they still sing this one. We were preparing songs for our missions trip last night. We didn't prepare this one. Maybe we'll uh, add this one in there. And uh, I'm, we're going to sing this song this morning. I'm going to put the lyrics on there. And uh, when Pastor brings out an older song, be careful my words here. Uh, when Pastor brings out an older song, I'm normally sitting out here and I sing along, and some of you know that I don't necessarily, I like to sing, but not necessarily on the microphone. And uh, so I expect you to sing with me on this. How many of you know the song, I'm in the Lord's Army? Come on, you sang that in children's church growing up. I know you're out there, and you know it. Don't make me call you out and put you on the spot out here. So I'm going to put it out there. I won't ask you to do the motions. I know you know the motions. So I won't ask you to do that. All right? But that's what I think of when I think of in His service, that we're in the Lord's service in the Lord's army, so don't mind my being off key here, you know, uh, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly over the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. Oh, all right. I didn't think we were going to get that. That was pretty good. All right, Father Abraham, here we go. No. <laughs> all right. Here we go. Oh, all right. Wow. That's pretty good. But I'm in the Lord's army, right? That's what I think of when I think of being in His service. That we're in His army. We're doing something for the Lord. We're in the service of the King. But it's also easily, easily done sometimes where we could, we could replace His kingship with our own kingship. And so Palm Sunday affords us an opportunity to kind of realign ourselves in this aspect. So as we look at Matthew 21 this morning, the, the account that we label Palm Sunday now, maybe we can use this time to take some inventory of our lives, just to look at some areas to make sure that it is all about King Jesus for us. You know, uh, so I think uh, for the most, most part in our lives that we want to keep our focus on the Lord, not just the most part, all the time in our lives, that we don't want to be people that are just taking up a spot in the rank and file of the army, but we want to be serious about the Lord. You know, that we mean what we sang this morning, that there is no other name worthy of praise, that there is no other king worth serving. And so just to give us some context this morning, Matthew chapter 21, the majority of Jesus' earthly ministry is kind of in the rearview mirror at this point. He's heading towards the crucifixion and the resurrection and a lot of the discussion and the miracles, the teaching that's kind of passed now. We're kind of heading to the final act, so to speak. So Let's take a look at the first three verses. It says this, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you'll find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Just a couple details here to help us out. Uh, if we read the verses just before this, Jesus and the disciples were in Jericho. And we know that the road from Jericho to Jerusalem wasn't necessarily an easy one. It was probably anywhere from 15 to 17 miles in length. Remember, no vehicles or anything like that. An elevation of about 3,000 feet. So it was a little bit of a journey there. And uh, Jesus refers to this road in his parable of the Good Samaritan. And if you remember that one, that's where the man is beaten and robbed on the road. So, you know, it was a little bit of a da uh, dangerous journey that they kind of just came through. But they get there and Jesus says, 
I want, he talks to two of his disciples and says, hey, go into the village and there you'll find a donkey with a colt. Untie them and bring them. And by the way, if anyone says anything, just say that the Lord needs them. We'll get back to that in just a moment. But the first area that we could kind of examine our life this morning on being in his service, being in his army, where we can evaluate ourselves is this. Are we following the commands of the king? Jesus instructed his disciples in a very specific way. Maybe it sounded a little crazy to them at first. We'll see in, a few, in the verses in a few, moment, in a few moments that Jesus was actually making a declaration of who he was. He was fulfilling a prophecy made about him centuries before. The disciples may have made that connection at the moment. Maybe they didn't. But the point was that they obeyed the king. And so let's draw that into our lives for a moment. Are we following the commands of King Jesus? What directions do we have from King Jesus into our lives? Just like two, these two disciples, we have clear instructions on what Jesus would have for us to do. And so I try to put myself in the shoes of those two disciples. You know, what if Jesus told me to go get these animals and bring them back? You know, and knowing my personality, I think that that would have been a difficult task. I would have been worried about the owner of these animals. You know, what, what, he, what would he have said to me if I, if I you know, had encountered him? And so I said, you know, maybe I would have tried to sneak over there and scope the situation out to see if he was around first. Or maybe I would have planned on my, my speech to the guy, you know, what I would have said to him, you know. Uh, hey, man, uh, Jesus sent me or, or you know, you know, I just take him be like Jesus needs him, you know, or take it up with Jesus. You know, what would I say to him? I'd be practicing it the whole way there. You know, I would be nervous. You know, what's this guy going to think when I when I'm telling him Jesus said it was OK, you know, that I could, that I could take his animals. You know, how would that work out? And, and it, we could really make an application to that to our lives today. We could be nervous if I carry out the commands of Jesus in, in 2015 today. What are people going to think about me? You know, if, I, if I'm in my place of employment and I begin to conduct my business affairs the way Jesus would have me conduct my business affairs honoring Him, what will my fellow co-workers or what will my boss say about me? If I love my enemies, what will my enemies and those that want me to hate my enemies say about me? If I stand up for godly principles in my school and I don't talk bad about the teacher or I don't cheat on the test, what will other people think about me? If I stand up for my faith, what will people say about me? We could be nervous about carrying out Jesus' commands today. I'm in the Lord's army. Oh, you're still with me. All right, good. I didn't know. I didn't know. 2 Timothy 2.4 says this. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. The focus must be on the commanding officer, which is King Jesus. In fact, the verse before this uh, Paul reminds Timothy that a good soldier does suffer. There will be times where other people are, accept, uh, are, are, are upset. I'm in the Lord's army. Okay, all right, good. I don't know if you're going to be singing with me through this or not. So the first principle that we can really take away from this here is are we following the commands of the king? Even when we're nervous about it. Even when we don't know how other people are going to re react to it. Certainly scripture is filled with commands from our Lord. Certainly the Holy Spirit prompts us throughout the day to do different things for our Lord. And it can be tough. The scriptures tell us that we're in a battle between the flesh and the spirit. It's hard to carry out these commands. But through the power of the spirit we can do it. And we need to ask for that power. We can live to please our commanding officer. So let's go for it. Let's ask him to equip us. Let's ask him to help us so that we can serve faithfully in his army to please him. Amen? So that's the first way we can evaluate ourselves this morning. The second way that we can look at it is this, because there's obviously another character in these first couple verses. He's not named and we don't really meet him and we don't know how the interaction goes down. But it's the person who owned the donkey and the colt. His role in the service to the king was to give. And so the second principle that we could look at this morning is what can we give to the king? Or we could term it like this, holding nothing back. Maybe we could ask it this way. Is there anything that we would deem untouchable in our service to the king? As we serve in the Lord's army, is there anything that we would say, don't ask me to do that? You know, King Jesus told those two disciples beforehand, he said, tell them that the Lord needs it and he will send it right away. In other words, King Jesus knew the heart of that guy that owned those animals. He knew that he would send it. He didn't have to be nervous. He didn't have to worry. He knew he would send it. In other words, he's one of my guys. 
He's in my service. He'll give you whatever we need. You know, we're all familiar with the referral system, right? Maybe, uh, maybe you've had a friend and, you know, everybody's got a guy, right? Everybody says, well, call my guy and my guy will help you, you know? Oh, you need a dentist? Call my guy. He'll take care of you. You got a problem with your car? I got a mechanic. Don't worry. I'll go with you. Just use my name. You know, call my guy. Everybody's got a guy, right, that, that can help somebody else out. We're familiar with that, right? Uh, we heard the testimony from, from, from Brother Stanley Premith, who was with us uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And he was talking to us, if you remember, when he, had, he finally escaped and he was trying to get to his wife. If you remember that part of his testimony, he was trying to get to his wife. And he was talking about how at that time, obviously, his body had taken a tremendous uh, physical toll at that point. And uh, he was mentally beginning to, to struggle. And he had made it to the location. I can't remember the name of the place where his wife worked, but he, he had gotten to that point, And people were already starting to look at him a, a little sideways. And he had gotten in there. And uh, there was a guy that had only met him one time, I believe he said. And uh, he said that this guy recognized him and said, Oh, Stan, how are you? Here, here's my shirt, whatever you need. Oh, this is Stan, whatever he needs. It's on my account. I got him, right? That was his guy now, whatever he needed. Well, let's apply that to being in the Lord's army. For this unnamed owner of these animals, we don't know who he is, but nothing was untouchable for the king. Maybe he was planning on selling these animals. Maybe he was planning on taking his own little ride later on. I don't know. The king needs it. They're his. Just say the word. Two of the king's disciples show up. Yeah, untie it. Take it. They're yours. No problem. Who knows whether he even got them back. The Lord needs them. All right. Now I start thinking. All right. If it was me, I'm out there. I got my, my animals. Two guys show up. I always wanted to have a chicken farm. You know, if someone showed up asking for my chickens, you know, the Lord needs them. What do you mean the Lord needs them? Where's the Lord? Why is he sending you? Why didn't he come get them himself? What's he going to be doing with them? Is he the only one riding them or are you going to be riding them? Why does he need both of them? When are they coming back? Are they going to be returned in the same condition? Are they coming back by 5 o'clock today? And I like details. If you know me, I like details, you know. I'm going to be asking all these questions. Instead, he says, yeah, take them to yours. Maybe he understood something that we need to all understand. They're the Lord's anyway. They weren't his. Psalm 24, 1 says this, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. It's all alone. This clicker is the Lord's. My dumb phone is the Lord's. The iPad's the Lord's. It's all the Lord's anyway. So, Lord, if you want it, it's yours. So is there anything in our life that we would say is untouchable to King Jesus? You know, Lord, you could have everything, but don't mess around with my job. Don't ask me to do anything there. Don't, you know... Don't touch that. Lord, you could have everything. I'll be in your service. I'll be in your army. But don't mess with school. I got, I got that going good the way I want right now. Lord, you could have everything, but don't touch my relationships. Or, Lord, you could have everything, but don't touch my finances. Or, Lord, you could have everything, but don't mess around with my time. Lord, you could have everything, but not any of my possessions. Lord, you could have everything, but don't mess with my entertainment, specifically from April to hopefully late October when the Mets are on. Pretty sure that was applicable to everybody, especially in the front row over here. We can learn from the owner of the donkey and the colt, King Jesus. If you ask for it, I will give it. Hold nothing back. May that be true of us. So are we following his commands? May we hold nothing back. The next couple of verses we look here, Matthew is going to kind of connect a few things for us. This would kind of be obvious to the people of, of, of the day there. Certainly uh, when they would see Jesus coming in on the colt, uh, the, the Jewish people of the day, this would send off you know, red flags for them. It would be like eye-opening to them because they were waiting for the Messiah. We, we see Jesus riding a colt. What, what, we're okay, what's the big deal? But for them, this was the fulfillment of a prophecy. They waited patiently for this. But Ma Matthew reminds us of this, and we could see it here in verses 4 and 5. It says, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to your daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so Matthew connects us with the words from Zechariah spoken centuries before. You know, many times through Jesus' ministry, he, he almost shied away from public proclamation that he was the Messiah. You know, many times casting out demons, he would tell the demons, hey, keep it quiet, you know, don't, don't speak. Um, certainly Peter declares that, that Jesus is the Christ and but at this point, Jesus is lifting the secrecy. 
you know, it, it, it's all coming out at this point. He's making a statement that was bound not to be missed by any, anyone. And, and, and so Matthew uh, lays that all out for us. But in verses 6 to 8, which, which we read before uh, in the translation, Yesu read it for us. And, and, and this is what it says here. It says, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large cloud, a crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And so what the disciples and the crowd do here is a sign of respect and honor for the king. And, and there's a similar scene in the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 9. A man named Jehu is declared king. They throw their cloaks on the ground for Jehu to walk on. So clearly they're seeing Jesus as a king here. And they're showing him the respect that is due of a king. So that kind of brings us to the next area as us in the Lord's army in his service that we could kind of evaluate ourselves on. And I started thinking, how can we apply this today? How can we have respect for our king as we're in his service? And certainly we could do it by the two ways we already talked about, following his commands as a way to respect him and holding nothing back as a way to respect him. And those are good ways. Those are daily service items. Those are critical ways and they're important ways and we need to do that. But I think true respect and honor for the Lord goes deeper to, than that. It speaks, of, it speaks of a personal communion with Him. It speaks of a deep relationship with Him. It speaks of the motivation of why we do those things. Why do we follow His commands? Why, why do we want to hold nothing back? It, it, it's something deep within our heart. I believe at least the disciples, I don't know about the crowd, we'll talk about them in a moment. But I believe at least the disciples, they laid down their coats because Jesus really was their King. And we have to ask that question for us. When we look at Christ, what do we really see? Do we see our King? Do we see our Savior? Is it personal? Is it real to us? Or, or is it a bunch of facts that we just know? Is it something we just hear constantly and over? Oh, it's Palm Sunday. Jesus is our King. Yeah, I know it. Check it off. Let's go out to eat. We had a good day. Or is Jesus really our King? Do we really know that? Do we really have that deep respect and honor for him? And I believe that view can only be gained by spending time with the commanding officer. Maybe we could think about it like this, and I want to acknowledge that this is not the best metaphor, but maybe this can just help us think about it for a little bit and on a human side of it. Certainly we understand that there is a level of respect that comes from someone having a title or a position. You know, maybe you have an employer or a teacher or a principal, and, you know, because of their position they have a level of respect. But then once you get to know that person, and you begin to spend time with them and you see maybe their integrity or you see their character and the way they care about people, then all of a sudden there's a whole other level of respect that's there because you know them and you know their ways, what kind of person they are. And if we think about Jesus and we think about the time that he spent in the trenches with the disciples, the king with his disciples, traveling on these long roads in, in, in between the cities with them, the conversations with them, days after this, Jesus, the king, would be washing their feet showing them what life in the kingdom really was. So they had this personal communion with Jesus. And so I think they were able to say to him, and say, yes, this is my king. I respect and I honor him. So yes, we can be doing things for Jesus, and all that is good, all that's important, but I think it's also important that we always check the motive behind it and make sure we have that deep relationship with him. You know, can that be our attitude? Can we say, not only have I done things for the king, but I spent time with the king. I know the king. I know the king's voice. I know the king's heart. I'm familiar with his ways. I have a deep relationship with him. I'm not in his service as someone that's just been merely recruited, but I willingly joined. I, don't know, just, I just don't know the facts, but I know his heart. He's my king, and I honor, him. I honor him in all that I do. I hope that can be our heart this morning. And I, I think the way to do that certainly is as we gather corporately, that's important, and we do that when we come here, but that's also important for us to do privately. As we spend time in God's Word and, and in personal worship, we can, get, we can gather that in, in our hearts. Matthew continues to drive, describe the scene for us in verse 9, and the crowd is beginning to grow. It says this, it says, The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven. I imagine that the scene was probably getting intense. This is the time of Passover and, 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 the, and the crowds would be pouring in. Uh, the, the pilgrims would kind of be coming into Jerusalem. So people are shouting. They're yelling out Hosanna. They're probably quoting from Psalm 118. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so there's people everywhere. Jesus is riding on the colt. 
Hosanna is a phrase that they would use. It means save us. Often they would use it before a king. When they would plead for help, if they needed mercy, they would go before a king and say, Hosanna. And so they're shouting this to Jesus, Hosanna, Hosanna. Certainly they did not know what they were shouting. Because this king would save them. Not in the way they thought, but he would save them. Maybe in their mind it was politically. Maybe in their mind it was militaristically. Free them from Roman rule. But Jesus was after something far greater. He was there to save them. And by way of extension, extension to us from our sin. So yes, Hosanna. Save us, Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Our king is savior. Our king is the only savior. And that's what they're yelling. That's what they're praying. Hosanna. That's what's being shouting by the crowds. I mean, imagine the scene. It says, you know, there's a crowd ahead of him and there's those that follow him. I don't know if they were in unison. Maybe they were. Maybe there wasn't. But there's a crowd over here. Hosanna. Hosanna. There's a crowd over here. Hosanna. 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 They're all shouting. All, and then Jesus is riding on the colt. And I started thinking, you know, the crowd has their picture of what they're expecting Jesus to be. Maybe some think, oh, he's going to, this is it. The king's going to save us. We're going we're gonna to free ourselves from Roman rule. This is it. We're going to get set up. All this. They got this picture in their mind. And here's Jesus riding on the colt, knowing that he's riding to the cross. As well as the resurrection. But this is what Jesus has in his mind. This is what Jesus knows what the Father has sent him to do. But the crowd has a completely different picture. Which leads us just to two more thoughts this morning for us as we are in his service in the Lord's army. The first is this, are we committed to the long haul? What I mean by that is this, are we quick to change our tune of Hosanna when it's not what we want from the king? Over the years I've heard it said this, I don't know how accurate it is, but I've heard people say this, the same people who sang Hosanna on Sunday shouted crucify on Friday. Whether they were the same literal people, I can't tell you. But it's a valid point for us to consider this morning. How easy is it for us to get swept up in the crowd? How easy for us is it to get caught up in what we want Jesus to do? Is he in our service or we're in his service? The crowd maybe want the militaristic Jesus or they want the political Jesus. If we apply that, is it about what we want from Jesus or us being in his service? Is it possible that we only want to be in his service when being in his service aligns to serving our purposes? Is it possible that we can be in his service on Sunday, but in the rest of the time we're in our own service? When we don't like how things are going, all right, Jesus, get off the colt. We're getting on now. Or is our attitude constantly, Hosanna, save us, Lord. Lord, I had a great day today. I'm still serving you. I'm still available for your army today, Lord. Lord, day was terrible today. Hosanna. I'm still serving you. Still need you to save me. Lord, my purposes were not accomplished today. Doesn't matter. I'm still committed to your service. Hosanna. Lord, my purposes were accomplished today. But it's still about your purposes overall. I'm still serving you. Long haul, thick and thin. Lord, you have all of me. Hosanna. If we're going to be in his service, we have to be committed to the long haul. The second observation that we could take from this last verse is this. That our king is deserving of constant praise. Whether the crowd was on the right, pra- on the right, on the right page as Jesus uh, is irrelevant. The fact is that the king is still worthy of honor and praise. So yes, Hosanna. He did save us. He did die on the cross for my sins and for your sins. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of every honor and every accolade. His, his name is to be lifted high. John the Baptist said it right. He's to increase and we are to decrease. And certainly we could lift his name up when we come in this place together. And we could do that privately when we're at home and when we're in the car or wherever we go. And so that's the challenge for us. Are we going to be in the Lord's army? Are we going to be in his service? Will we follow his commands? Will we hold nothing back? Will we cultivate that deep respect for him? Are we going to be committed to that long haul? In his service or our own service? And we will lift him up with our praise. May we focus on what our Lord did for us on that cross. He paid it all. The old hymn says it right. Jesus paid it all. He did all the work for us. May we not get it backwards. May we not think that somehow being in His service means we're earning anything. We're not. Jesus already did the hard work. 
Being in, our, being in His service is just our way to honor Him. So I'm in the Lord's army, yes sir. I'm in the Lord's army. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly over the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. The truth is this. Every one of us is in some army. We're all serving someone or something. We're in someone's service. I hope this morning that we could examine our lives and know that we're in the service of the King of Kings. I close with this statement. I recently heard this from a man named Tim Keller. You may be familiar with him. He said, the only person who dares to wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child. We have that kind of access. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross, gave us that kind of access. So let's put our faith boldly in what our king did for us. And as we do that, let's not just shout Hosanna with the crowds, but let's proclaim and live that he is king and be in his service day by day. God bless you.